uh, founder and CEO of Hawk Media, founder of Hawk Ventures, Hawk Capital, Hawk AI, Hawk, uh, best-selling author of The Hawk Method. That The whole iOS 14 change with Facebook and iPhone is a great example of this where everybody, if you ask 99, 95% of marketers uh, if Facebook performance dropped last year, they'd say yes. 5% would say a little bit, but not really. Why that is, all that f happened on Facebook is Apple changed the, changed the tracking ability on iPhones, which is a big portion of Facebook traffic. So, especially in the US, so you can't track it. Does anyone actually think that purchases through Facebook dropped because of tracking capabilities? The answer is no, 100% no. But the problem with agencies is 99% of them don't have any idea what they're doing. They don't know how to drive revenue growth. They don't know how to build a company. They know how to sell services. What's something new happening in your life right now? Baby, I have my first child. Yeah? Hello, fellows. Welcome to the next episode of Jagged with Jasravi. Subscribe to my channel for conversations at the edge with thought leaders from the branding, marketing, and the business world. Conversations that ignite new ideas, ideas with rough and sharp edges. Hi, Eric. Great to have Hi. you on my show. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, Eric, if I requested you to tweet your profile, what would you say? Uh, founder and CEO of Hawk Media, founder of Hawk Ventures, Hawk Capital, Hawk AI, Hawk, uh, best-selling author of The Hawk Method. So I've got a venture fund, a uh, financing arm, an AI tool, and then a marketing agency with about 220 full-time people. So so what's Hawk uh, got to do with it? How the Hawk came into your life? <laughs> I grew up in a small town called Ojai in California, and I uh, was told by a Native American chief when I was seven years old that hawks were my red tailed hawks were my spirit animal. So when I went to name my company, I didn't think I was creating a big company at that point, and I just wanted to keep it simple and I was advised to. And so I always loved hawks and threw it on there. And when I was searching for the domain name without the E, like the proper spelling was taken. So I threw an E on there and it was free. So that was it. <laughs> This is very fascinating. Do you feel like a connect or oh, in the sense that symbolically there is there are certain qualities that a hawk would have and you feel like it inspires yeah. you also all have? Yeah, it's an apex predator uh, in the sense of like there's not it doesn't have to watch its back. It gets to just, you know, run the way it's running or fly the way it's flying. Uh, we use all sorts of double entendres like we like to soar and, you know, fly with us and all these things. It's like the idea is like the freedom of a hawk along with the hawk eye and, you know, sort of the laser focus combined with the freedom and the lack of concern so that you can be sort of forward looking, hard charging and focused. What are all the things that, yeah, definitely embodies. Yeah, awesome. And it's also like a bigger view because they fly higher. They yep, the bird's eye view. It's always, yeah, better and, and uh, yep. more full, more complete, and hence better decisions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so you started really early and, and uh, we'll explore the India connection, which is like really yeah. amazing. I mean, I'm still processing that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how did this whole sales marketing uh, thing enter your life that early? Like I'm talking six or seven years old, like class one, you know, when, when you you hardly yeah. know anything of the world. So how did that happen? And what did it uh, do to you? What did you learn about these concepts? Yeah, I mean, at six, seven, I think it was more just my dad built a really interesting accident. I don't know that this was on purpose, but he was an entrepreneur. And he built sort of this uh, intrinsic motivation to make money with me. And I say intrinsic, not extrinsic, meaning like, it wasn't to make money to buy something. It was just the idea of stacking money I became fascinated with at like four and five years old because he would be like he would he actually taught me mental math like doing math in my head by saying like okay I have a quarter and a dime how much is that 35 cents great I have two quarters and a nickel how much is that and you would do it in your, you know at five you know but then math my entire life came easy to me and so and so when I was six I don't know where I got the idea of selling things door to door but I decided that was the best way to do it and so I walked around my parents house 
and I put everything that I thought they didn't need anymore. I was a six year old. I was like, they don't need my, these are my dad's old golf balls. He doesn't need them. And these are, you know, my mom's flowers and all this stuff. Like they don't need them. I put it all in a trash bag and I literally walked in my neighborhood door to door trying to get people to buy stuff for five and 10 cents. I just threw out numbers and I didn't know any different. And so that was my first foray. And I think I made a, a dollar that day, but I was like, I made a dollar. Great. And then when I was eight, I wanted to uh, play electric guitar and I needed to buy one. So I told my dad I wanted an electric guitar and he said, great, verbatim. I, I won't use the swear word, but my dad said, get a effing job. And I was like, okay, like, you know, in hindsight for an adult to tell an eight year old to get a job is kind of ridiculous, but I didn't think it was ridiculous because I didn't know any better. So when my dad told me to get a job, I went, okay, I'm gonna go get a job. I realized no one would hire me. So I started selling flowers on the side of the road that was taking forever. So I was like, how else can I make money? And I saw Beanie Babies, which were like the little beanbag animals got really popular that year. And I saw people were paying crazy numbers for them. So I started buying the good ones and collecting them and selling them. And I ended up making as an eight-year-old like $4,000 that year. And so then I bought the guitar, which was $150 for the whole package with the amplifier and everything. I bought a BMX. I'm sure I spent other money. I think I bought a skateboard. And then I uh, put the money away for a car. I was eight. I was like, I'll save the rest for my car when I need it. Selling and marketing and sales and understanding people and why they bought things started at six years old. And even before that, because my dad was a hard guy to be around in, in that sense. He always made me sell him on everything. So I was constantly having to be on my feet. You know, it's such a big thing because at the end of the day, you're, you know, everything that you're doing, there is a selling and a marketing involved. You know, you're selling yourself, you're marketing yourself. Yeah. I mean, if you just look at it as a big force that is, you know, making things happen in the world, I mean, it's such a big lesson to get so early. So amazing. Now we are going to uh, benefit from all the lessons that you've learned, at least in a capsule, the Hawk method. You know, the moment I uh, came across this method, I was struck by the simplicity of it and instinctively it felt so correct. Let's get to the method. How did you arrive at it? So uh, Hawk method, three stages. We're talking about awareness. We're talking about nurturing and we're talking about trust. The idea is to look at what the context is in which someone is receiving the advertisement. People make the mistake of thinking like you have to pick the right platform based on the demographics, like who uses it. But most of the social platforms, most of the big digital stuff, Every, and even TV, radio, et cetera, you can find almost every demographic at this point. So it's not about where individuals are because most of you can find a cohort of any type of demo on all of these. It's about what are they doing during that period? The example I'll give is Google, I'm actively looking for something that I need. I'm searching for something. So if you're a type of product that solves my problem, you should advertise there. Whereas Facebook, I'm not actively looking for you. So if you're a type of product, you need to create new demand for it. You need to get people aware of you that aren't actively looking. You should be maybe more on Facebook. And the, that goes, I could go through the whole list, but we, we cover a lot of different channels and how to think about how to leverage those platforms for sure. And nurturing. So so let's cover all yeah. the stages briefly. Nurturing, because when you say nurturing, it's 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 so such a big word in the sense, you know, like engagement in such a small subset of it. Like you're really yeah. nurturing um, uh, constantly with genuine care, you know, that that's what come across. So what is this stage about? And why yep. it's becoming even more critical yeah yeah it's it, thank you for saying that because it's way more critical now than ever because people take time to buy something and so the fallacy that most marketers fall into is i advertise i get it out there and then they'll come and buy or not and it's like no 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 no. people forget they're distracted there's a hundred things going on everybody's like this all the time now so you have to stay in front of them you have to nurture them to get them to that point of sale and most people do not buy as quickly anymore so in the united states the average sales cycle online is about a month so it's somewhere between three and three weeks and three months, but the average all over is about a month. So knowing that if I send you an advertisement and never talk to you again, yeah, in, within a month, you're going to forget about me. So I have to follow up with you with emails and text message marketing and content and all these different things to keep you in front of you and creating value so that you actually will convert into a customer. And so all those tools like, again, email, SMS, content, uh, anything, you know, how your website's built, all of these things that help nurture that customer to get them to a sale. They are critical to actually making your advertising work. Right. And also lifetime value uh, is something that you've talked about. Exactly. Like people make the mistake also of only valuing that first purchase of a customer. But if that's how you look at your business, you're never like, obviously repeat customers are what drive the business. That's why every restaurant talks about like customer service even exists. 
So you can't afford to have one-time customers. That's where in the US, Casper, the big mattress company ended up struggling because people bought a mattress and then what? You're done, you bought it, you're out. Like they tried all this other stuff that didn't work, no one cared. So uh, they end up being, have, have, they've been struggling. And so with your business, you have to figure out what does that repeat purchase look like? And so it comes down to things that same tools, email marketing, SMS, content, et cetera, also customer service and merchandising. Like one of the biggest mistakes I see companies make, even from a marketing perspective, is you don't have the products to upsell and cross-sell into. So there is no, that's the mattress example. There's no ability to build lifetime value and you have to, like it is really expensive to buy a customer. If you're not getting two things, one ongoing lifetime value and two word of mouth. So they're telling other people to come with them. You're gonna have a really tough time competing. And all this, this whole, ecosystem is competitive because what you're willing to pay in advertising versus what someone else is willing to pay is all based on how much they can maximize the returns on that. So if you're not doing all these things to maximize your conversion, to maximize your lifetime value, to maximize your uh, what's called K factor, but that word of mouth piece, you're going to lose to the people that are maximizing that. And Eric, do you think having a D2C platform uh, is uh, enabling this? Because I see a lot of companies sometimes from one product, in quickly they'll get into a range uh, and have a D2C platform and expect that the sales of the original product is also going to you know, double treble because the stickiness of the platform or, or just the you know, extent of involvement with your consumer is going to increase. But yes, owning the customer and having the ability to cross sell them because you're D2C versus being on like Amazon where you get to sell your one product, but you don't get any ability to cross sell them into your other products. Like I'm a big fan of having a D2C component. That being said, there's also benefits to being on Amazon. You can get a lot of organic sales if you become a high rated product in your category. So it just depends on the company and the product, but I usually say there's benefits to both and do both. Now we're gonna to get to trust and we we'll, we'll come back to nurturing, but uh, so awareness, nurturing and trust. and. Yep. We are in a trust deficit world post COVID yeah. more so. <laughs> yep. Like there was the time when when some brands were com you know communicating their whole cam campaign was um, you know trust your eyes only you know like we'll do it in front of you like the sanitizing yeah. etc. Oh so, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean that that's the extent of the world that you shrunk in. You don't trust your own people, your relatives, or nothing. Yeah. Oh, you everybody's an enemy. You know you can kill me. <laughs> So, yeah. you know, I mean, definitely the jury is still out what has stayed with us of that. But still, I mean, it is yeah. a trust deficit world. Fair. So Agreed. how what would you say immediately about it? How do you build trust today quickly? Quickly is to, well, as we put it, borrow it from other people that already have the trust. So it depends what your audience trusts, but it could be PR. It could be endorsements with celebrities. It depends like who would I trust? And again, you talk about COVID, like we are in a weird deficit world where a lot of those things are very different because how many celebrities in the US told people to wear masks and the Americans were like, no. Like, so that who that people trust has definitely shifted, but people still trust someone, you know? And, and it's weird because here it's so politically bifurcated that it's like, if the Republican celebrities say to do something, Republicans will do it. If the Democrat celebrities say to do something, the Democrats will do it right now. That's kind of how it feels here. So that means if you can get someone on both sides to both talk about your product in a positive way, you'll probably get a lot of trust from both sides. So it's it's a weird place. That, that being said, I'm, I'm speaking to the COVID piece, but in terms of just in general, also remember that depending on your product, how much trust do you really need? Like if you're selling fashion, like, I just want to know it's going to fit well. It's not going to fall apart. It's going to look like it does in the picture. So if, you know, you I see a piece of press in a nice fashion magazine about you or a cool influencer talking about you, that's probably enough for me because I, I assume that they have something to lose by promoting you incorrectly. So there's probably, it's enough. Now, if it's take these, uh, take this medicine to cure cancer, probably going to want some more credibility there. Like it really depends on the product you're selling on how much trust is really needed, but all products need some level of trust. They'll help with conversion because what happens is even now we're dealing with this US, so many Chinese companies advertise on Instagram right now with really, really nice creative. But when the product shows up, it's just like laughable how bad it is. And it's a really, it's like been an ongoing meme and joke now, like what they expected, what they got kind of thing. And so people stopped buying as much off random Instagram ads. So now you have to show, no, 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 we're not just some random product made in a factory somewhere else and that's going to show up and it's not good. 
it's a legit product. Here's some reviews. Here's people using it. Here's vid videos help. It's again, thinking about how do I build that trust to get that conversion? Because people, they just don't want to deal with the headache. Like it's not, it's not that it's most of the, again, unless we're doing with something you ingest, it's not about like a safety issue when it comes to trust. It's more about just like, am I going to get what I think I'm going to get? Or am I going to have to deal with returning or trying to or scamming or whatever? Like, I just want to know that I can I have a baseline of trust that this is going to be what the company says it is, is usually what you're going after. And the problem is, is if you don't get some sort of third party validation, whether it's again, reviews, testimonials, PR, uh, endorsements, et cetera, then you're the only one, your company is the only one telling me that your company is good. Yeah, I that doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. I don't know who you are. And then over time, we also talk in the book about how trust is brand. So over time, as that brand builds and you build consistency and you build recognition, then you can say, this is what we're launching and you can trust us. McDonald's, like them or hate them, when they launch a new product, the people that like McDonald's go get that product or try it out. You know what I mean? It's because it's they already trust McDonald's. They don't need anyone else to tell them how it is. They know what it's from McDonald's. So it's like, as you build a ubiquitous brand or even a mid-level brand, the people that know you will start to trust that and you, it becomes a little easier. Yeah, there are levels of trust and there are dimensions of trust and there's how much trust you need. But it was very interesting when you talked about branding within the space of trust, you know, like the third yeah. facet, and you can do it through a brand because it's going to uh, imply consistency and it's going to imply yeah. what you should expect and hence what am I, I mean, what am I promising and what should you expect? And, and then of course it's a circle. Now we're going to the next level of all these stages Eric, when in, in this kind of a thing, when everybody, everybody knows, okay, let's do engagement uh, with content. Uh, let's do, let's do some influencers. And, you know, the more and more I see how brands are building case studies and, you know, they can pay who anybody to come and say anything, you know, yeah. it's, it's like when I come to know, okay, was this a paid thing? Oh my God. You know, oh, this yeah. person, you involve this person. And he was yeah. ready to come and tweet about it. And I'm like, oh, my God, you know. So yep. in, this, in this kind of a world, Eric, how do you, how, how, it's it's baffling from a consumer's point of view, you know. I mean, the tr making a choice itself is becoming such a burden, such a, such a complicated thing, you know. Like, like you'd say, okay, let me not make a choice. Let me just go with familiar stuff, you know. So well, that goes back to why purchase cycles are getting longer because people have to think about things more. They don't trust everything. So like there's a whole aspect of marketing, as I'm sure you know, the direct response world, like Guffy Ranker and the big companies that all they did was run TV ads to buy now, buy now, buy now. And all of those companies are struggling because people don't purchase that way anymore. People don't buy now, buy now, buy now. They want to learn about it. They want to they have all the information in their phones. Like they want to find out who you are. And so people take their time to think about it, to make sure they feel good about it. And you mentioned like hiring any influencer. The irony there is it does not, influencer marketing doesn't work like it did in 2015. Like the FTC's regulations of influencer marketing really affected it. That being said, Nike and Michael Jordan with Jordans, like everyone knew Michael Jordan got paid for those. They're still, I don't know if they are the best selling shoe of all time, but they're definitely the highest collectible, the most sought after. Like, and he was paid for that. He was endorsing, like that was all big. They knew why it was there. So that remember that that the idea that the influencer is hired doesn't necessarily mean that people won't pay attention and won't like it anyways. So like that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it definitely would have helped if Jordan said, I'm not getting paid and I'm doing this for free because Nike's the best shoe on the planet. Like that would have been even more. But even today, like it, any type of validation is good validation. Um, if I if you don't know me as an example and I'm hanging out in India and I'm with. I don't know, the guy that started, oh, let's say uh, instead, I'm in India and I'm promoting my book. And you don't know, I'm with a marketing friend that's sitting there and you come up and you look at it and my friend goes, oh, this is the best marketing book I've ever read. He's the author, you gotta check it out. You don't know that guy, you don't know me, but just from someone saying something created trust in you. You, It's more than just me. I didn't say, this is my marketing book. It's the best thing you'll ever read. You're, that doesn't mean anything. But this random person saying you should trust him works. It's a human nature thing. I don't know where it comes from biologically, but any type of third party validation, even if I don't know that third party helps. 
So influencer marketing works because of that. Even though I know it's paid, even though there's a ton of other things that I could question, it's still a checkbox that allows me to feel that much better about purchasing something. Now, again, it goes into how much trust do I need to purchase that? What type of product is it, et cetera? How expensive is it? What is it? Th those apply too. But for an everyday impulse buy, kind of like, yeah, sure, this looks cool. I'm going to buy it. You don't need that much. Mm -hmm. And yes, yeah. Our brain functions like this. We 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 pick up points of references all the time. Otherwise, you know how how. Otherwise, again, we'd have to think deeper and and take more yeah. time because I mean these are also the shortcuts that we need. So uh, so Eric, when you say nurturing and and you know content marketing, content uh, this engagement is again something new. No matter uh, you know how many years it's been, it's a it's a new thing, right? Every brand, no matter what they're selling, you know, they have to put out content. They have to put out, put it out in all kinds of formats. It's a, it's a new phenomenon for marketers. Um, mm -hmm. Digital natives might respond to it a little differently, but how do you do it well? Because, uh, you know, is this going to be relatable? Is this my tone of voice? Uh, uh, how many likes should I, should I be okay with? You know, uh, I'm not getting an organic reach and, and, is this really getting into conversion? Is ROI happening? I mean, there's so many yeah. questions to it. Yeah, I would caution two things. One is to operate in a vacuum and just try to look at your own metrics as if that's the full picture. Because the example I'd give is, let's say your Facebook advertising, is the performance is down 10%. Well, mm -hmm. if your Facebook ads are down 10%, but the market is down 30, stop wasting your time. You're outpacing the market. You're actually doing great. And so... That doesn't mean to, you know, I also want to be cautious of looking at the market too much, but it's important to know the forest from the trees, so you know, like, that's not my problem right now. Let's go focus on other things. Maybe Facebook itself is the problem, and I have to find alternatives to Facebook to make my business better. These are the kind of things you have to work through. And so that piece is super important when you're trying to figure out where to focus on. And then two, like, careful with shiny objects. Everything's popping up all the time. There's all this new stuff, this, you know, whether it's, well, TikTok's banned in India, right? Yeah. Yeah. So not TikTok there, but here TikTok is, I think it might end up banned here too, but right now it's the big thing. And Snapchat was big and this is big and that, and there's always new platforms. You don't need to be the first mover to be successful in marketing. Let other people go figure it out and break things before you get in there. Because like most of marketing is actually about scalable and scalability and repeatability, not quick sugar rushes of we found the thing that made a bunch of money. Like that's not helpful in business. They, we call them sugar rushes and they're, at, they're as bad as a sugar rush where you get really hopped up, your revenue spikes, you build infrastructure to cover that. And then all of a sudden that revenue goes away because it wasn't scalable and repeatable. And now you got all this infrastructure you got to pay for. And honestly, long term, you end up losing money on those channels. So I'd much rather spend most of my time and effort on things that we know work, that we can continue to repeat and continue to double down on and optimize. And that's been where we focus. Hmm. So the key principles are not changing. It's it's you have so many more uh, right. ways to do it, and and how your right. consumer is processing things has changed. Marketers also, I see that in trying to catch up, you know, they they throwing a lot of complicated jargon, and they, they're never really sure if it's happening, that's, not happening. That's exactly it. Stay away from jargon. Keep it simple. No one's that smart, and it's not that complicated. The moment it feels complicated and all over the place you're probably doing something wrong. And so it's really, that's why and my favorite review of the book was, I don't get it. It's basically just modern marketing 101. It's like, that's the point. Like it's supposed to be, it isn't that complicated. And the moment people start getting really like, you know, overselling themselves into how complicated it can be is the moment that you start doing things that you can't track. Like my favorite example of this is attribution. Okay. Everybody, I don't know about in India, but here attribution became the buzzword of the decade where it's like, we got to track attribution. Like if I get a customer and they clicked a Facebook ad and then a Google ad, and then an email, how much do I attribute to each of those channels? Is it 40% Facebook, 40% Google, 20% email? Is it 30, 30, 33, 33, 33? What, you know, and how do we track that attribution? How do we give credit? If I'm marketing and to get a customer, they had to click a Facebook ad, a Google ad, and then an email. You know how much I attribute to each of those channels? 100, 100, 100. It took all three of those things to get that sale. Trying to divide up that revenue by channel, it took that entire cost to get that revenue. How, how that breaks out is literally a guess. And so to actually try to do this, I've had this debate with a lot of people. And now it seems like it's swinging the other way that people are agreeing with me. It's a, it's a fool's errand and you're overcomplicating the situation. So whenever you're trying to figure out like, how do I 
do this. Like you have to just go back to rational logic where it's like, this is the things that it takes to get me a customer. Here are the tools we have. Here's why people click those. Here's the customer journey that they're going through. And what are the things that make sense that are going to get people as clear to a customer and stay a customer as they need to, and then put those tools in place, then get data, understand that data doesn't tell you the full story. So really look at the data from a logical lens. That's critical too. that the whole iOS 14 change with Facebook and iPhone is a great example of this where everybody, if you ask 99, 95% of marketers, uh, if Facebook performance dropped last year, they'd say yes. 5% would say a little bit, but not really. Why that is, all that f happened on Facebook is Apple changed the, changed the tracking ability on iPhones, which is a big portion of Facebook traffic, So, especially in the US. So you can't track it. Does anyone actually think that purchases through Facebook dropped because of tracking capabilities? The answer is no. 100% no. Nobody stopped buying through Facebook ads because Apple, you, because the marketers can't track. Now there's some retargeting things that you can't do as much anymore, but consumer purchasing is still at a record high. So do, nobody should think that that's what's going on. The problem is no one thinks about this stuff logically. They look at a spreadsheet and go, oh, our Facebook ads are down, pull the numbers back. And it turns out what Facebook really changed was the ability to track. So it looked worse. It wasn't actually worse. And so this is, and it literally hurt Facebook's revenue this year, along with every e-commerce company, because they all, because frankly, again, most marketers aren't savvy enough to look at that and go, wait, why is this struggling? Let me think through the logic of this and like un make sure that I understand why it's not performing. Because if you don't ask why with everything, you're just going to make decisions based on spreadsheets and you're going to get un overwhelmed because you're not thinking clearly. So what's really happening when this is happening? What does that mean? And why is this happening? What? So somebody has to keep asking, what does that really mean? Exactly. <laughs> if, that, if that's a drop, if this yeah, is- It's like the little kid, like, why, why, why is the sky blue? Well, because of the reflection of, well, why? Because of this, what, why? Like, you got they got to go down that path. You got to be inquisitive. Like, you, as a marketer, like, that's one of the most important things is curiosity. Why is this all happening? Like, let's figure this out. And it, I mean, for us, it ended up being amazing for us because we realized early and it took a few months, but we realized pretty early, oh, wait, Facebook performance is great. It's just tracking. So let's just plug in third party tracking that does work on iPhones. And oh, look, this this actually happened. A company that Facebook is reporting 1x return on ad spend for is actually getting 15x. So they were about to cut off $100,000 a month Facebook spend, which they the Facebook is telling them is only making them $100,000 and they have cost of goods, et cetera. So that wasn't going to make any sense. Turns out that hundred grand is actually driving 1.5 million in revenue a month. So they turned that off. They're screwed. And they didn't even, thank God we caught that because the a, a ton of Shopify companies and a ton of e-commerce brand didn't catch that. And so you see the average before Q4, the average Shopify site uh, year over year was down 20% on revenue. Because so many people, the, the now last year being a spike because of COVID and everything was also a part of that, but they also pulled back so much because they saw they thought Facebook wasn't working. We saw it in Q4, the reporting from Facebook was so bad. In Q1, we had never seen this before. So many people just disintegrated their budgets thinking that they wasn't doing anything. And now we find out, oh no, that was driving a ton of that revenue. You just couldn't see the tracking. So Eric, now, uh, so in your book, you've, uh, you know, you brought everything, uh, you know, the concept and the why behind uh, everything we do so that one can put it in perspective. You know, what is SEO going to do for you? What does yeah. a Google ad mean? Exactly. Why? What are you going to? Yeah. What, why? And what you get out of it and when? Yeah. And hence, of course, you can decide, you know, when and how much you want to do. It's one of my favorite things to ask founder or people that come to us for services. People come to us and be like, I need SEO. Why? Well, because I need to drive sales. But why do you think SEO? Well, because my friend told me I need SEO. Interesting way, reason to do it. Like, mm -hmm. I think you need Facebook ads or I think you need email marketing, but I'm curious why Like, I need this. Like, people don't think, you, you question yourself as part of this too. Like, what does SEO do? Like, I mean, it, none of this is that grandiose. Like, it's not rocket science. Like, SEO is about organically ranking at the top of search. There's no paving the way for anything. It's just... It's a slow build so that you can get some organic traffic later. So it's an investment you make that creates a great sort of foundation if your company is driven by Google. So if there's keywords that you want to rank for to make sure that you show up so that you can kind of have this gift that keeps on giving that now when everybody, like for us, if anyone ever searches for marketing help, 
us ranking number one for that would be great. So everyone goes to Hawk Media when they need marketing help. Like, great, that would be awesome. And there's a lot of those type of keywords you can go rank for. And that's, it takes a long time to get those ranks, but you do it right. That is a gift that will, you know, it it's slow and steady to get there. And then it grows and grows and grows. And you end up with that organic side of things. It's one aspect of marketing that's super helpful and creates a great foundation. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I would say it like, does any it doesn't do anything for other channels much you know like it's more and that's yeah again it, it it all works together but the the idea that like seo is some baseline it's the gift that keeps on giving not for a company that needs to show quick revenue if you have to get going quick seo is a slow build but in to any entrepreneur you should be building something for sustainability and that's where seo is great but mm. a lot of people don't have the luxury of it takes a year to rank for that so like they if someone has Ten thousand dollars to spend a month. I'm seeing U.S. kind of context on marketing. I'm not telling them to go high on SEO for them. I'm saying like start spending on some ads and then reinvest in some SEO and some longer term stuff. There is there is a very interesting uh, you know topic that you've uh, taken in your book. Hiring <laughs> a marketing agency over an in-house marketing team can be a better use of resources. And you put it in perspective. Why don't you quickly share with our audience what, what does it really mean? I think it's a balance of both. So in-house. Generally, you're dealing with uh, trying to attract talent. Like if you're not one of the best brands out there or one of the coolest startups, like trying to assume that you're going to get some really good marketers in is, you know, not a rational assumption. Like if you want to get like, again, opportunity cost is huge in marketing. You need really good talent. Good luck compete. Like I, this is what I found from the beginning. Like I can get really cool people because we're an exciting place for marketers. Marketers really want to work at Hawk Media. If you're an uh, injury law firm, Good luck at hiring an amazing marketer that wants to work in your law firm. Will they work with you as a client? Totally. Are they going to want to come work for you full time? Probably not. And so the idea of like trying to build an in-house team in most companies is a fallacy. You're just by nature going to get mediocre people that couldn't go to one of the cooler companies. So that's one piece. Um, let's say you're able to solve that and you actually can attract them. They're also expensive good marketers. And so building it all in house is not usually cost effective. And then even if you solve both those problems, you can afford it, you get the great people. Now you're operating in a vacuum. And we talked a lot about the forest from the trees. If you don't have that outside perspective, you're in trouble. And so that's why agencies exist and every major company uses them. But the problem with agencies is 99% of them don't have any idea what they're doing. They don't know how to drive revenue growth. They don't know how to build a company. They know how to sell services. And so it's really hard to find a great agency. And on the other side, um, the few that are any good tend to get really expensive, want long contracts, high minimums. And this is what motivated me to start mine is I was like, why don't we be the best at what we do, but really easy to work with? Why doesn't that exist? And that's how we created and built Talk Media. Yeah. Even smaller companies with lesser resources have the right to, you know, get the best uh, uh, of uh, resources and yeah. the best uh, of them out there. Okay. And a little bit about AI. Uh, when you talk about future of marketing, you've talked about uh, artificial intelligence and its role and programmatic marketing. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's what I was saying is I think that artificial intelligence eventually it will replace a lot of what we do. It's going to start by helping see that benchmarking in that in those insights, and then it'll grow into actually helping you make some of those fixes. And over time, a lot of what marketers do can be automated. And at that point, then it's going to be how do you remain competitive if everybody's using the same tool? And so creativity is really where that's going to come out. But you know, a lot of the stuff we do will get automated. And so we've started building that with Hawk AI. The idea was, why don't we get ahead of it? Is there anything else you want to say when you, you know, crystal ball gaze? Uh what's really happening, what's emerging? No, I mean, honestly, it's really just realizing, let's put it this way, uh, Facebook and Google are still the best digital advertising platforms uh, out there. They're still the, the best. So to, the idea that like, I've got to stay on top of this, things are changing over time or all the time is a fallacy. Like it's more stay aware of what's happening, but don't get, how do I put it? Overwhelmed. Like don't don't drive yourself crazy. Yeah, exactly. I shoot the question, you shoot the answer. If you if you take time to elaborate or you know this yep. thing, I shoot this. Okay. Quickly, are you ready, Eric? Yep. Alternate profession could have been snowboarder. What would you do on Mars for fun? Uh mountain bike. Uh a book you'd like to gift to all your friends. It can't be your own book. The Appetite for Self Destruction by Steve Knopper about the self-destruction of the music industry over and over again. 
What's something new happening in your life right now? Baby, have my first child. Yeah, how old? Yeah. I mean, it just three happened. Months. Oh yeah, my god! Yeah, just happened. Three months. Yeah. Your life has changed. What's your favorite childhood memory? Probably my bar mitzvah, an event where all my family and friends were around us. Like it was just yeah, awesome. Hmm. If you were to devote the rest of your life to philanthropy, what cause would you choose? Education. Hmm. Your greatest joy. Currently, my daughter. Oh, <laughs> how would you like strangers to remember you? Uh, I, I the same way most people talk about me is fair, kind, high moral compass. What is a lesson that took you a long time to learn? I will always have to. As the owner of the company, you're always going to have to drive. No one else is going to do the work for you. I would request you to share your online addresses. Um, yeah. emails, anything that you want to say of how people can reach out to you, anything about your book, what would you like? Yeah, to say just say that? social media at or slash Eric Huberman is probably the best way. And yeah, and it'll be in the show notes. Cool. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you so Thank much. You. Wonderful. Yeah, like, share and subscribe. This has been awesome. <laughs> <laughs>